My name is Daryl Miller. There's my Twitter handle on the slide. I spend quite a bit of time on Twitter, so if you ever want to reach out to me, I'm happy to chat with folks who are interested in APIs for all kinds of reasons. I work for Microsoft as a product manager uh, on the Microsoft Graph API that exposes all the Microsoft 365 cloud services. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about SDKs, or sometimes people just call them client libraries for HTTP APIs. So the first question is how do you feel about SDKs for APIs? Generally what I find is people either love them or they hate them. Even API providers who actually hate them themselves still have to actually build them because some customers absolutely demand that we provide uh, SDKs. Personally, I've never been a big fan of them. I spent a bunch of years trying to figure out ways that I could build them that I actually liked. Uh, and I made some progress and then I got a chance to, at Microsoft to work on how the SDKs were built for Microsoft Graph and the opportunity to do it the way I think it should be done, so I jumped at it. But how do they make you feel? This is how most, many people, especially more experienced developers, feel about SDKs. They feel limited, they feel constrained, because they feel there's no flexibility. And one of the reasons that often SDKs feel like they have no flexibility is because they're designed primarily for a single use case. In developer experience, we like to call TTFC, time to first call. Because onboarding is critical. Getting people started using your API is absolutely critical. And it's important to make it really easy up front. But designing for flexibility brings complexity. So it's avoided. So people run into brick walls with the SDKs. And then there's the other whole challenge with SDKs. You have to do it in multiple languages. You can't just do it in one because people, developers, are using all kinds of different languages on different platforms. Well, the only cost-effective way to do that is with code generation. And code generation is a double-edged sword. It can make some things really easy, but it also makes it really easy to make poorly architected code. Supporting cross-platform with CodeGen often means only supporting lowest common denominator features. Now, there are SDK code generators out there, and some of them aren't bad. Uh, and, and so management kind of go, ah, oh, this SDK thing, what is it? You just take an open API description, you feed it to Swagger CodeGen, boom, you're done. We don't need any work done. We only have to assign one or two developers for those eight languages that we're going to support. But the end result is often poor with limited flexibility. And developers end up working with it, running into a roadblock, not being able to do something with that SDK, and then going, oh, this is just too hard. I know how to use the client library. I'm just going to use the client library and do it myself. And they throw away the SDK. It's a use it all or none of it type of situation. And what we really need is a kit. It's called a software development kit for a reason. We should be able to pick and choose the parts that we want to use. So the new users get their fully streamlined approach, so they get a really great time to first call. But folks, when they actually start building commercial products that we need to ship, we need that flexibility and we need to be able to fine tune certain things. We want to be able to get under the covers, peel off the layers, just use the parts that you want to use that we don't have to have to build ourselves. Users need to have choices. So what we're going to look at today is the approach that we're starting, and this is really just starting uh, on the Microsoft Graph team to build better SDKs for all of our users. So the place that I start is what most developers are familiar with. On your native platform, you have some kind of HTTP library. I don't think there's a platform out there in the world that doesn't have some kind of library to help you make HTTP calls. And generally, they'll have these three components. An HTTP interface for doing get, put, post, delete, if you're lucky, options, trace, head. Uh, and some often there'll be models for uh, a request object and a response object. And devs know this. They know how to make calls using this library. But some stuff's just a pain. So we want to make some things easier for them. 
So one way we can do this with another common pattern that is supported in a lot of commercial libraries, it's called using a middleware pipeline. And middleware pipelines are awesome for applying cross-cutting concerns. We'll dig into it more deeply in there. So you can insert extra capabilities there, but still use your natural native library the way that you're used to using it. But we can do more. One of the challenges with middleware in a lot of libraries that I've seen, it's a bit of a pain to get those, that middleware pipeline chained up because they're so often in kind of a Russian doll model. It's a bit, and you often have very standard things that you want to set up every time you created your native HP client library. So default headers, default timeout values. So let's throw in a client factory. With a client factory, we will pre-build a client library, a client HP client instance that you can then use that's pre-configured appropriately. Across an API, you're often sending requests and responses that are very standard across an error content. There shouldn't need to build an error payload for every, uh, an interpreter for an error payload for every single resource out there. We should be actually reusing it across APIs, but that's just a conversation for another day. But paging, batch requests, multi-part content, these are things that should just come out of the box with SDKs. And we're not talking about any particular domain at this point. Response handling. For a lot of status codes, we can, out of the box, here, this is what our standard behavior is for a 429, for a 413, for a 503, a 502. Out of the box stuff. If you want to do something different, you should be able to. Like, you shouldn't be locked into any of these components. It should be pick and choose. At the moment, we've not done any code gen. This is all core capabilities. But we can add more value with code gen. We can layer a nice clean, simple service client on top that helps us to discover the different capabilities that are available in the API. And we can auto-gen this from some kind of API description language. Not suggesting which one you should use, but there are good ones out there. Code genning models. Like nobody wants to have to hand code a bunch of classes for uh, types that you need to use within the domain. And also request builders. There's a lot of value being able to bring, build classes that create requests in a particular way that is designed for a particular API. I'm going to layer one more piece over the top of that, which is a notion that it's kind of a crappy name, but it was kind of the best I could come up with is tasks. So the idea of a task is supporting scenarios where you have a coordinated set of HTTP requests to achieve some common goal. So let's dig a little bit more into middleware. You've got HP, you're making a request, you get a response back from your service. What are the kinds of things we can do? We can put authorization handlers in there to generate tokens automatically. We can deal with redirects automatically. Caching, private caching is a vastly underused capability on client side. Bundle it in your SDK. Retry handling, who wants to deal with 429s when it can be just done automatically? Now, some of these particular capabilities require some extra support infrastructure. Uh, auth handler, don't rewrite your own OAuth handling stuff. There's libraries out there that can do it. So write an adapter to some standard library. We use, uh, Microsoft, we use an MSAL library, which the Auth team are, are building for Auth2 against Azure AD. Uh, obviously, you'll need some kind of storage provider for being able to store tokens, refresh tokens in there. But you can use those storage providers for other things. If you get a redirect that's a permanent redirect, why don't you actually persist it? Because if somebody makes another request, it's a permanent redirect. Store it in the storage provider so you don't make that request over the wire the second time. They say the best latency of a network call is no network call, right? Caching handler obviously needs uh, a storage provider. Retry handling. When we first started building this, we're like, oh, that's really easy. We just, you know, wait for you get a 429, retry after. Uh, header, we'll just wait for that time. But then what happens is other requests are coming in also. And because you may have a multi-threaded client that's making multiple requests. Well, one, the second request needs to know that the first request has actually been throttled. So you need some kind of request queue. But then in big, bigger services, that gets more complicated because sometimes the throttling is per user. 
Uh, so, because this user's been throttled, but that user hasn't been throttled. Sometimes, in the case of the Graph API, the Graph is a facade, the Microsoft Graph is a facade over many different workloads. So you can get throttled when accessing your email messages, but not throttled on any other services. So we've been building this request queue in order to be able to manage when incoming requests should actually be placed into the queue in order to respect the 429 throttling. Uh, in order to be able to know the user, be able to do a user queue is, well, we need to know who the user is. Well, these are kind of independent components. They're standalone components. One of the nice things about a middleware pipeline is you build these individual components separately and just insert them in the queue. If you don't want, like, one of the particular pieces of middleware that comes in that SDK pipeline, you can just take it out and put your own in. That's fine. They should be interchangeable. But then you end up with dependencies between them. I said the retry handler needs to know who the user is. But it's the auth handler who actually figures it out. So flow a piece of request context along the line. Attach it to the request. Attach the user to it. So information can actually flow down through that middleware pipeline. And uh, we ended up actually attaching what we call middleware controls on there too because each of these different pieces of middleware have a set of behavior based on default parameters. But sometimes you want to override it on a case-by-case -case basis. You're going and you're downloading a four gigabyte file. Maybe you don't want to do an automatic retry uh, if something fails somewhere down the, the road. Maybe you want your app to actually take a moment, pause, ask the user, are you sure you want to retry this? So you can put custom configuration parameters into that middleware control object that again flows down through that pipeline. So there's all sorts of capabilities that you can build into this SDK, node code gen required, and add a ton of value to your consumers. Another major piece of the puzzle, it's, like, it's wonderful, this pen, but it only seems to make it like halfway through the slide deck, and then I have to go back to the got to figure out why. Request versus content. We have this really bad habit when we build SDKs of just pretending that we're just doing RPC with the procedure call. And in an RPC signature, you have a method name and you have exactly the parameters that you're going to send. You have exactly the things that are coming back. HTTP is a lot more flexible than that. And one of the ways you can take advantage of it is separating the request from the content. Imagine this package, the request is the wrapper. What we don't know what can go inside it. You can wrap all kinds of different things with that wrapping. So we can take advantage of this. So if we start with our native library again, but I've added an extra piece, because in some client libraries, they actually model the body, whether it be a request body or a response body, as a distinct type. Sometimes it's just a stream, an array of bytes, a string, but you do have some kind of body. But there's value in adding some additional semantics to that payload you're sending over the wire. And when you're building an API, sometimes there's a lot of common concepts that you can implement. I mentioned before about error content. If you're dealing with webhooks, subscribing to a webhook can be a standard thing. It doesn't matter what it is you're subscribing to. Use a standard payload. Collection contents. There are even standardized media types for transferring collections across the wire. Uh, when you're dealing with a single entity, you can have certain standard things. And status monitor for long-running operations. Unfortunately, that was one thing the web standards body is never actually standardized, but there's no reason why you can't do it within your API and make these as reusable classes. And of course, we can code gen also the model types, because again, we don't want to have to rebuild all of that. So we've got the content out of the way. Now we can do request builders. And there's a variety of different ways that you can do request builders. And you can give developers the choice as to how they want to do it. They want to just use templated with, a, with a, a URI template. They can build a template builder like that, and it can be core code. You want to get a bit more fancy, build a fluent request builder, you'll probably have to code gen a fluent request builder. So as they're typing the code in and they hit dot, they see the different resources that they can access and build that request for them, attach it to the particular content that they're trying to access, and life all gets easier for everybody. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this notion of content, because it has this really other interesting concept or characteristic of it being composable. 
So let's say you have this collection content that you're sending or you're receiving. You can actually wrap these things. So if I want to stream a content, you can wrap it inside a streaming content. It's still just a piece of HB content because we've abstracted it away. Uh, you have a multi-part content. You want to compress it. You wrap it inside a compressed content object, and it's still just a payload. It will be serialized to a stream of bytes. It goes on. You could sign and encrypt that content, that compressed content, that multi-part content. So this leads us to one other little interesting characteristic of content objects. Generally what we do is we attach a set of content headers. Now I know when you see an HP request, you just see a blah of headers. But there's actually a distinction between the headers related to the request and the headers related to the content. Usually they start with content dash. And if you read the spec, they actually call them out as separate things. Interestingly, if we go back to our first example, wouldn't it be nice to be able to sign and encrypt content that is streaming? But you can't because headers, if you want some kind of signature, the headers go out first and the body comes out later. And if we're streaming it, how can we know what the set of bytes are that went over the wire and sign them if they've already gone out over the wire? We can't write the headers anymore. Except you can because there's this notion called trailers. It's been in the spec for ages, just nobody ever really, really implemented it until fairly recently the browser vendors actually started implementing trailer headers in the browser. The fetch, the JavaScript fetch API implements trailer headers. This model supports that concept. Which brings me to one of my favorite analogies is you go into a car and you use the cruise control. If you go and look in almost every car I've ever been in. They have the exact same set of instructions. You want to do resume, accelerate, set, go. I'll probably find it's different in Europe. If you're in North America and you go to any car, these are basic, they look completely different. The buttons, the knobs are different, but it's the same set of operations that you can apply. And when you apply that selection, it then takes care of the nitty gritty of actually pressing the brake pedal and pressing the accelerator pedal. And this is a little bit what tasks are doing. It's raising that level of abstraction. So now you say, I want to achieve this goal, and it, there might be a bunch of HTTP requests that need to occur in order to make that happen. So you end up, you have some kind of task that is modeled within your SDK, and you say, I, I, the user wants to take this action. Well, we need some input parameters to configure it. And internally, you'll hand it an HTTP client that your factory created for you. And you hand it an HTTP client, and it will go off, and it will make the request that it needs to. And maybe it will raise some state change events so that you can update UI to see the ongoing process of this task. And it will update the internal current state so you can maintain state between those different requests. But you wrap this whole concept up into a concept called a task. Now let me, uh, it's a little easier to see it as a concrete example. Uh, APIs love creating these page collections where you return a set of things and then there's a next link. But then, so many times I see people make the call and they're like, well, I'm just going to iterate through all of the pages because I want to get all of the things. Okay, fine. Well, let's make that a little bit easier, right? You make the request. In this case, we're using the client to make a call to get the list of all their messages in their inbox. Slash me, slash messages. Get me my email. And I get a page collection. So I take that first collection. Well, then what am I going to do on all of those messages? Well, I create a little callback that says, I'm going to do this in case I'm just going to log the data out, right? And then I create a page iterator, I give it a client, I give it a page collection, I give it the callback, and I say, just go for it. If you happen to hit a next link, make the call. So I've wrapped all that ceremony up inside my task, and the user can just get back to doing what it is they want to do. Which brings me to my last uh, concept, which is the response handler. And if you look at code that people write in calling APIs, they make the H they build the request, they make the HTTP request, and then they do something with the response. And in most languages, it looks like that is just occurring in line. But again, in most languages now, that is actually an asynchronous request. And if you're living in raw JavaScript, you actually write it as a callback. So it's going to happen at some point in the future. That code really isn't executing in line. And you can actually take advantage of that with HTTP and end up building a more flexible client system by using what I'm calling a response, a response machine. 
So a response machine, what you do is you set up a bunch of response callbacks. You assign a bunch of callbacks to the machine and say, okay, when this happens, do this. When this happens, do this. If this is the status code and this is the content type, if this is, this is a 400 and you get the error content back, then go off and do this. If this is a 429, go ahead and do this. You can put all these callbacks in. Then what happens is when the API calls to, uh, when the API is called and you get a response back, you just hand the response off to the response machine and the response machine does whatever it has been programmed by just looking at that response. There's a concept in, in REST called self-descriptive messages and if you were able to follow that pattern of self-descriptive messages, the response machine should know exactly what to do with that response and be able to act upon it. Now, obviously, we need to do something with the data that comes back. So when the dispatcher fires off to the response machine, often those callbacks are going to want to go and update some kind of application state because we want to take that data that came back and somehow update our application with that application state. And you can, by building this kind of infrastructure, you can make it a lot easier to create reusable code and also flexible and evolvable code because what today, an API may only return one status code, but tomorrow it returns a status code that you weren't expecting. Well, as long as the response machine has been programmed to deal with that type of response, it already knows how to deal with that particular response, even though it is a different API than previously. So, just to conclude, what I want you to think about is when you're building SDKs, generated code can actually only be a small part of the SDKs. And it's the generated code that is tough to get really good quality, but that's okay, because it only needs to be a small part of the SDKs. We should be building SDKs that bring value to all levels of developers, not just the getting started experience. We should be able to help everybody. And we can do that by building things in a more flexible way. And last but not least, don't hide that HTTP model. It is extremely valuable and people need to be able to get access to that in certain scenarios. So make sure that people can peel away the layers and they don't have to throw your SDK away when they hit an edge case. With that, thank you very much.